Let's begin with some basic chromatography. Before we start talking about basic chromatography, we have to understand some of the makeup that goes into the gases that we're trying to separate and therefore measure. First thing that we have to know is some of the basic building blocks of how we make things up. So if you haven't been to school for a while, then you probably haven't seen a periodic table in a while, but we're gonna need to get one of those. So we're gonna print one of those out and then we're going to start examining some of the periodic table and how our atoms, our protons, our neutrons, and our electrons make up our different elements. When we talk about atoms and atoms forming to make molecules, so think of some of the ones right off the top of your head that we see every day. Hydrogen, hydrogen, well, in the chemical plant, H plus H equals H2, hydrogen. It's already hydrogen, but whenever it turns into H2, then it's actually a legitimate molecule of hydrogen. Whenever we're talking about H2O, we're going to take two hydrogens, join them with an oxygen, and then they're going to form H2O. Now, why do they form together? All right, well, first thing we need to do, let's go ahead and get that periodic table out. Number one, number one on the periodic table, smallest, lightest, tiniest guy, hydrogen, hydrogen, H. Hydrogen has one proton, one electron. You do not get any smaller than hydrogen. Number two on the periodic table, HE, HE, helium, helium, two protons, two electrons, that's it. You don't get any smaller than these two guys. They are the very top one and two on the periodic table. That's going to come in very handy later whenever we start talking about carrier gases. Because guess who are the number one carrier gases on the planet? All right. So first off, if we want to start talking about chemistry and the basic chemistry that has to happen in our world for things to exist, all right? The way I'm going to break this down right off the bat is we'll start with hydrogen. Hydrogen, and I have to break, I have to say these things kind of in a dumb way so that people understand and remember them. So what's the first rule of Fight Club? First rule of Fight Club is, don't talk about Fight Club, but that has nothing to do with this. The first ring wants to and needs to. This makes absolutely no sense to you whatsoever, but a while ago, when we had the periodic table up, hydrogen is number one, and I told you that it has one electron, one proton. We have a nucleus. Everybody say nucleus. Inside of the nucleus, you're going to have protons and neutrons. Those are your center. Those are your main weight. And we'll get into weight in a little bit here protons and your neutrons. Then you're going to have electron rings that surround them. Now, first ring wants to and needs to. This is where your electrons go. So on hydrogen, we have one proton, no neutrons, and one electron. What is the first rule? The first ring wants to and needs to. So this guy is wandering around, looking, and trying to find another electron for this outer ring. This outer ring will not be satisfied until there are two. So what we do normally is we're going to find another hydrogen. And that hydrogen says, I have an electron. I'm looking for an electron. And this one says, I have an electron, and I'm looking for an electron. I need my outer ring to have two. So those two guys will get together. And they will share their electrons. And they will become H2 hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay? Helium. Number two on the periodic table. 
Helium has an atomic weight of four. It has two protons and it has two electrons, no neutrons. Two protons, two electrons, no neutrons. It is completely happy being helium all by itself. It doesn't want to bond with anybody else. It doesn't want to do anything. So our first rule was the first ring wants to and needs to. Helium has two protons in its nucleus. First ring has two electrons. It, the rule is satisfied. Helium is satisfied. It's completely balanced. It has two protons. It has two electrons. So there is no electrical anything. It is neutral. Because it has just as many protons as it does electrons, it is noble and inert. Noble and inert. It will not bond with anybody. If you take a look at the very right-hand side of your periodic table, you will see other gases that go down, and they are also noble and inert and will not bond with anybody. Can you name a gas that welders use to purge pipe? They use a little green hose, and you see them with their tape, and they put the hose in there, and they put the tape, and they're purging that pipe with this gas, and this gas will not blow up. It will not bond with anything. It will not do anything except for clean the pipe out. What gas is that? And it's on the periodic table on the far right-hand side. And it starts with an A. Okay. So, words to remember off of helium. Noble and inert. Well, that's all fine and dandy, and helium is one of our best carrier gases that we use for our GCs. But let's get back over to what makes up a whole bunch of our world with being a chemical plant. We will start talking about... Well, let's do this one real quick. Let's do carbon. Carbon makes up so much of this planet, it's not even funny. Where do we find carbon on the periodic table? Carbon on our periodic table, it comes in at number six. Comes in at number six, identifies as C. Carbon has an atomic weight of 12. So we have six protons. We're gonna have six protons, six neutrons, giving it the weight. That's what gives it its actual weight in the nucleus, and a good way of trying to say that is what makes up the weight of your atoms. So you're going to have your nucleus, that's your weight. The bottom half, that's neutrons, positive ha uh, top half is protons, the hairs on my head, those are the electrons. So if you get on a scale, this way is so much, that way is so much, what is the hair on your head weight? Hardly anything. Electrons are tiny, 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 tiny. They are tiny in this world, but they pack a punch. Their electrical charge means a whole lot more than their size. So, we'll get into that too. The weight of the atom, though, is made up in the nucleus of the protons and the neutrons. And when we're talking about carbon, it has an atomic weight of 12. We're gonna have six protons, six neutrons, making our nucleus. So we're gonna have six electrons. Six electrons, First ring wants to, needs to, and it can only have two. First ring wants to, needs to, and can only have two. So six protons, six neutrons, one, two electrons, that ring is full. Done. We have to jump out to the next ring. Next ring, one, two, three, four, five, Six. All right, so that is all of the makeup for carbon by itself. That is carbon. It has a total of six electrons. Now we get to rule number two. So what's the second rule in Fight Club? Yes, don't talk about Fight Club. Okay, second rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club, but that is not what we're doing. Second ring wants eight, needs eight, and can only have eight electrons before we have to jump to the next ring. Now, how many do we have? 
One, two, three, four. We need four more. We have a valence. Write that word down. Valence. We have a valence of four. We need four more electrons in order for carbon to be satisfied on its ring. That's the law. The law is the law. We have to go and complete that ring. So what are we going to do to complete that ring? The easiest thing to find is more than likely going to be some hydrogens floating around out there that are running around with their little one electron and trying to find somebody to bond with. So let's take a look at how that would work. Here is the structure of our carbon as we are sitting. We have six protons, six neutrons, and then six electrons. Our inner ring can only have two, and then we have to jump to the next ring. It has four at this point in time. We need it to have eight for it to be satisfied. It's looking to bond. Now, you can look up covalent bond and ionic bond. Covalent, ionic. Ionic is stealing. Covalent is sharing. Sharing is caring. So, let's try to figure out whether we are covalent bond or ionic bond. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to move this hydrogen with its one electron over and join up here. And then we're going to move this one over and they're going to share there and then move this one over and they're going to share there and then move this one over and they're going to share there and then everybody is going to be C1 carbon 1 H4 and that is known as methane hydrocarbon get it get it hydrocarbon okay okay while we're still playing around with the periodic table we're not going to let it go just yet there's some other important guys on here that we deal with on a daily basis as an analyzer technician and gas chromatography of course we've already established hydrogen minus lightest little bitty guy on the planet helium comes in at number two not worry about that guy that guy now nah, don't worry about that guy definitely got to worry about carbon a whole whole bunch then we got nitrogen oxygen all right the air we breathe is how much nitrogen how much oxygen 20.9 oxygen, 78% nitrogen. What's the rest of it? A little smidgen of argon, some other crap in there, you know. Um, don't buy into the global warming thing. Don't buy into it. It's not real. We're going to talk about oxygen. Oxygen falls at number eight. Number eight on our countdown. And so if we were to break that guy down, we're going to have eight protons, eight neutrons, eight electrons, First ring, full. Two. Can't handle any more. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So our outer ring has one, two, three, four, five, six. We have a valence of what? How many do we need? How many more do we need to complete that ring? Dose. So, if we find a couple of hydrogens floating around, and we go pick them girls up. Hydrogen come in. And we're going to share. And then another hydrogen is going to come in. And we're going to share. So now how many do we have? So now how many do we have in that outer ring with bringing a hydrogen? Bringing a hydrogen with our oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We completed the outer ring and we made Mickey Mouse. Or otherwise, we made two hydrogens and an oxygen. We made water. Want to see a bigger one? Let's see a bigger one. Manganese. Manganese. From the Manganese tribe. First rule of Fight Club. One, two. Done. Second rule of Fight Club. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight. Done. We don't want to go anywhere past that really because we're not chemical engineers and we don't have to. That's the only rules that we need to know for right now. Need eight, want eight in that second ring. Need two, want two, can't have any more than two in that first ring, and you jump out. Protons, positive. Electrons, negative. Neutrons, all right. So, there is a balancing act that is gonna go along with all of this, with whether it's electrically positive or electrically negative. Let's talk about the word ion, look it up. Whenever you come back, start this again, ion. Ion. All right. We've established that carbon can go and grab four hydrogens and make it C1, H4, and be methane. Remind me not to use this area of the board. C1, H4. These are representing the bonds. That much better? Okay. Carbon, hydrogen, methane. Who comes next in the alkane family? Alkane family, saturated hydrocarbons. Saturated is a word to look down and write down. Saturated means full, happy, complete. Alkane family, wicked happy people. Very, very happy. We'll get to the other people in a little bit here. But the alkane family, we are starting with methane. What though if this carbon was running around and it didn't find another hydrogen and it ran into another carbon and bonded? And then they found a bunch of hydrogens. And so then you would have C2H6. C2H6. Ethane. Oh, well what if we ran into another guy C3H8. C3H8. Otherwise known as propane. Propane. Now, each one of these is in the alkane family. You know this because they end in A and E. All of their legs are going to one person. They're not, they are very saturated and they're all happy. So everybody understand alkane, super happy. Their life is good. Everybody's making money. Everybody's happy in the alkane family. Now, this continues on all the way up until we do cyclone and we are not going to get into that. But I do need you to understand to be able to count to 10. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, no name, decane. Count to ten. Be able to do the count to ten. It just shows that you're actually being disciplined enough to learn this. All right. Let's concentrate on propane for a little bit. And this is going to directly fall into the gas chromatography and separation of gases and how you separate them by their size. Oh my, who's bigger, propane or methane? Get there, see, understand. Who is going to have the absolute lightest vapor point? And the heavier you go, the hotter and hotter you got to get these things to make them be a gas because they want to liquefy up on you once you start getting past your isobutane, normal butane. You start getting into your pentanes, isopentane, normal pentane, neopentane. Those guys start wanting to liquefy up on you. You start getting into things like hexene, hexane. Those absolutely want to be a liquid. 
And that's why we spent so much money on all of our sample bundles, heat trays, keeping everything super wicked hot, because otherwise the sample will condense back down into a liquid on you. You will not get a representative sample of your process. Your GC won't be seeing what it's needing to see and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. If you're not being, if you're not seeing the hexene, then the DCS is going to call for more hexene. Throw more in there, throw more in there, throw more in there. Guess what? You're ruining the plastic. Everything's going to the dumpster. Why? Because you're not hot enough on your sample bundle because I got wet and tripped the circuit or something. For some reason or another, we're not hot. If you're still living in the Stone Age and you have steam, then your steam got plugged. You're not hot. It's dropping out. It doesn't want to be a gas. It wants to be a liquid. Again, we'll get more into that. But let's talk about, write down alkane family. Again, be able to count to 10, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. Propane is a saturated hydrocarbon and member of the alkane family. I'm going to introduce you to its extremely pissed off cousin that is nowhere happy. And the reason that they're not happy is because they have a double bond. So we are no longer C3H8. We are C3... H6. And being C3H6 and having a double bond, and the double bond makes this guy very, very unhappy and very explosive, this guy wants to get rid of that double bond and will do anything to get rid of it. Does anybody know this guy's name? This guy's name is... Propylene. Propylene. Man. Does not want that double bond. We'll do anything in this world to get rid of that double bond. And that's why they are super easy to take advantage of and to turn them into something we want them to be. Because you can take very mad things and make them be what you want them to be with just a little bit of heat and pressure. That, 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 goes, that goes so far. I can preach on that. But anyway. Propylene. We will take that double bond, and this guy is great as a feedstock. So you hear of polypropylene plastic, polyethylene plastic, eem, eem, eem. We take advantage of the fact that they're mad about that double bond, and we can get them to crack it, join with somebody else, and become something else. Propane, being super wicked happy, alkane family, it is not wanting to bond with anybody. It does not want to do anything, it just wants to be propane. What is propane good for? Cooking crawfish. That's what propane's good for. Heating your house. That's what it's good for. Remember though, propane and propylene are C3s. Both of them. So, the only thing separating them is a couple of hydrogens. So they're very close to the same boiling point, almost identical. And they're almost identical in weight. So how are we going to separate those guys? Look at that. So, propylene, ethylene, feedstocks. Propane, ethane, stuff like that. Not feedstocks. Right now, Exxon, over in Baytown, building a super cracker. What are they going to crack? They're going to crack ethane into ethylene. Chevron Phillips, I-10, Cedar Bio, super cracker. What are they going to crack? ethane into ethylene. Use ethylene as the feedstock, make plastic, make lots of money. Okay, that is the process. Another thing on that, when you make plastic, you fill your reactors with a gas of isobutane. Circulating, circulating, circulating. Have you seen when you pass by the plastics plants, Enios, Us, um, Exxon, when you see the people that are making plastics, Total, over off of uh, Battleground, you see the very tall loop reactors. At the bottom of there, they have a pump where they are pushing and circulating. By the way, this is hundreds of feet up into the air. We are circulating in this loop reactor isobutane. It is expressed I. C4, isobutane. 
C4, methane, ethane, propane, butane. Isobutane. We circulate isobutane in this loop reactor as a gas, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. That is our carrier in the process. What do we turn into plastic? Ethylene. So we'll throw some ethylene in there with some catalyst at the right temperature and pressure. They hit, they make snowflakes. It's magic. It's awesome. They make snowflakes. We can also add a little smidgen of this and a smidgen of that to make the snowflakes even better. We add hexene in there and it makes the snowflake kind of go this way. And then we throw hydrogen in there and it cuts the limbs off of the snowflake. And so it makes them the perfect round shape. All right, the perfect size snowflakes. So we get that whole chemistry going with, you know, this much ethylene, this type of catalyst, and then we're gonna throw this much hexene in there and this much hydrogen and and again, making the perfect snowflakes. All right, but the important thing I want you to remember here is isobutane, because it's a ane, it doesn't react. It doesn't react with anything. It just circulates and pushes everybody around through there and then we recover it and use it back over again. The ethylene is what we're using to make the plastic. And then we recover whatever we don't use of that too and just keep throwing it in there until it turns into plastic. You're going to turn into plastic. So that is the process that we are doing. All right? So that is a little, that is a little basic lesson on plastic. We'll get into refineries too. Now, I think we are pretty good here on the alkane versus the alkene family. Happy, super mad. Matter of fact, another word that you will hear on the ship channel is HRVOC. Highly reactive, volatile organic carbons or compounds. You can say it either way. But the HR ones are the double bond guys. Those are the ones that ethylene, propylene, acetylene, uh, butene 1, isobutylene, 1,3-butadiene, trans 2, and cis 2 butene. You look for those in your HRVOC. Your plant probably doesn't have a whole bunch of that stuff, but they're going to look for it anyway. The HR, highly reactive, is because of the double bond. That's what makes them highly reactive. The other ones are just VOCs. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, isobutane, normal butane. They're just VOCs. They're not HR VOCs. So let's start talking about our basic chromatography. Gas chromatography. Not liquid. We don't want liquids. Gas chromatography. Alright? What are the basic things that we have to have in order to have a GC, a gas chromatograph? Well, first thing we're going to need is we're going to need carrier gas because we have to push the gases through the GC. They don't just magically flow through the GC. You are going to have to force these gases to go through the GC, we're going to need carrier gas. So we're going to have our bottle, and we got our little gauges, and our regulator. And so we're going to have our carrier gas to push everybody through there. A typical carrier gas is going to be one of those two very, very, very light guys on the periodic table. Number one was hydrogen, number two was helium. Well, let's just go ahead and throw, we'll just throw helium on there, all right? We're gonna have to have our carrier gas to push everything through our GC. We are going to have to have a sample valve. We are going to have to have a column to separate out the components. And we're going to have to have a detector. That's pretty much the uh, basic GC. Carrier gas, push everything through. Sample valve. We're going to have a sample. We're going to inject it. We're going to push it with the carrier gas through a column. And then go to a detector to get measured where we will see how much it was.
This is an advanced Optichrome. This is an older model, GC. Uh, applied Automation was bought by Hartman & Braun, and then Siemens ended up acquiring them, but ABB actually tried to acquire them, but they said it was going to be a monopoly, and they wouldn't allow it to happen. This is a service panel. This is a service panel. It plugs in right here, and then it's magnetic. We can pull this guy off, put it anywhere we want. If you're not being able to see the screen very well, there's a knob. You use the knob so that you can see exactly what we are supposed to be writing there. You'll see analyzer technicians hitting buttons, and you're like, I don't know what they're hitting, I don't know what they're doing, but it looks like a good job that makes a lot of money. Well, it is. And that's probably a whole bunch of y'all are thinking, I want to go into analyzers just for the money. Well, actually, it's, it's way better than just the money. Anyway, analyzer display will take you to the main screen of the analyzer that you are talking to, that you are plugged into. Analyzer display will take you to this guy. If you're on a network with other ones of these, then you would hit Analyzer 1 display for this guy, Analyzer 2 display, and you will talk through the data highway over to the other analyzers. All right, so we have our data highway coming in. And data highway channel A, channel B, backup. So we have two of those heading up, heading out, and going back over to wherever we're actually wanting it to go. In this case, we're going over to an NAU. This is an NAU, a network access unit, which allows you to have multiple different guys coming in and talking on a network, and then you being able to talk to it through the computer. This is your data highway coming in here. You have to have a certain card to be able to talk to that guy. And then the other ones, see, that's a whole lot easier whenever you can just go that route. But in order to talk to these guys, you have to have that data highway coming in off of that guy going to the NAU. We were discussing some of the things that you absolutely have to have in a GC for it to work. The first thing we said you have to have is a carrier. The carrier will come in to this regulator right here. All right, The carrier regulator sets the pressure that you're going to use to push everybody through the GC and make them, to, make them go to the detector after they're separated out with columns. The carrier regulator is what will tell you how, what will set how fast your peaks come out and then as long as the carrier regulator is set and solid, then the peaks will come out at the same time, every time, time after time. GCs work on constants. GCs work on constants. GCs work on constants. GCs work on constants. Constants. We're going to have an oven. This oven is going to get to a temperature of typically 140 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? 60. That is two numbers you need to know for the rest of your life if you're going to do gas chromatography. 60 degrees Celsius is 140F. 60 degrees Celsius is 140F. When we talk about chillers and stuff like that for our Sims, 4 degrees is 40. 4, 40. Okay. So, back to carrier regulator. You will set your carrier regulator with your carrier gas coming in, and that is what's going to push everybody through the GC, separate them out with the columns, and then make it to the detector. Carrier regulator. You've got your valve air for stroking the valves inside of the oven. Let's talk about just these three right now. Your carrier regulator for your carrier gas to push everybody through the column, separate it out, make it to the detector. Carrier gas regulator, super important. Valve air to stroke your valves inside of your oven. If you're using one of these guys, then you're typically going to have model 11 valves. Model 11 valves need like 60 PSI. No more, no less. What is a model 11 valve? This is a model 11 valve. All right. How many legs? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many legs? It says it on the top there. One, two, three, four, five, six. It tells you who they are. Each one of these is numbered, stamped, numbered. We will go over the drawings of this guy to fire this guy. 
on off and we will talk about that very quickly here. Model 11 valve. Carrier gas pushing everybody through. Valve air stroking our valves that are doing the on-offs to send the gas through the oven. Oven air. Oven air is going to be 15, 20 PSI. The oven air is going to send air. The oven air. Air is going to come off of the oven air regulator. It's going to come through and it's going to come down and go into the heater. The heater is like, it's 120 volts, which warms up the inside here. Um, all right, let's just say it this way. When you go to your grandma's house and they have that little space heater in the bathroom where you turn it up to 10 and it looks like a, inside of a toaster oven and it gets orange, super red hot, that's what's going on inside of here whenever it's really cranking the voltage up to it and just keeps you know hammering and hammering with amperage and it gets it super glowing red and then you put air coming in across it then the air comes up and goes out and blows 15 psi that you set there is going to come in and come out here blowing into this oven with that hot air and that hot air is going to warm this up and we're going to read that temperature and as we read that temperature it's going to be controlled and get to 140 degrees and we will slow down the whap, 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 hitting the heater whenever we start getting to that 140 degrees. Now we're going to overshoot it and then undershoot it and then we're going to line out and then it will get to 140 and line out and be super happy. But that's what the very top gauge right there for when you say the oven air. We're doing that just for the heater to get the oven to 140 degrees F. GCs work off constants. It has to stay at 140 degrees. If you increase the temperature, the peaks will come out faster. If you make it colder, they'll come out slower. Think of it in your head any way else. You know, if you're real cold, do you move fast? No. If you're real hot, do you move fast? Yes. So, same difference. These are relays. The relays for sending the voltage, 120 volts, down through the heater. Since the electronics can't really handle doing the pow, pow, pow of sending that 120 volts open and close, open and close, open and close, sending that 120 volts. You utilize relays. So you send a small DC voltage to the bottom of it, and whenever it gets that DC voltage, it opens, closes, and open and closes that relay. And on the other side of the relay, it opens and closes with the open and closing of this side, allowing the 120 volts to flow through and go down and warm up the heaters. See how the wires come off of it? We're going to go down in here, and we're going to head down, and we're going to come down into here. I've had to change out quite a few different heaters in my lifetime. And if you ever make the mistake of just completely pulling this guy out, disconnecting the wiring and just pull this guy out, you're screwed because it's going to be hell trying to take your new heater with wires and push them back up through this guy. You have to actually cut the wires off, leave some of it, and fish tape up your new wires with the old wires. Columns do the separation of the gases. Columns look typically like this. You can have glass columns which are 100 foot long and they're wicked tiny skinny. But a lot of times this is what you're looking at. This is a TCD, thermal conductivity detector. We will discuss that a lot in, in just a little bit here at the top. All of this used to be a lot, is, these used to look a lot different than what they are. But power entry control module, PECM, power entry control module, it distributes a lot of the power. There is the same type relays, just newer versions of them as to what we were just looking at over there. You have an over temp relay and a control relay. If you notice, those over temps are just going to stay on and let you know that you're okay. And then you're going to have your control temp relays over here. This one is not an air bath oven. This is an air bath oven. This is an airless oven. How do they do it? They do it just basically like an oven and they warm up the walls. Is your DPM, Detector Personality Module. 
These wires are coming off of your detector. In this case, it's a TCD, thermal conductivity detector, coming up to the detector personality module, which will interpret your readings and then send them on to the syscon. Syscon is inside of here. That is your motherboard. It's basically a computer and we are telling it what readings we are seeing and then it will do just like a computer what we tell it to do with the integration and such like that. Beautiful, beautiful. Battery backup. Communications card. And get your butt back in there. All right. These are called EPCs, electronic pressure controllers. EPCs are what's going to be taking your carrier gas and pushing through the valves, through the columns, and sending your gases to the detector to be measured. Electronic pressure controllers. Notice the little dip switches on it. Does everybody understand binary? If you do not understand binary, we will make you understand binary. Little dip switches. All right, because they have to know who they are. They're all daisy chained together and all those wires are basically the same. So now you have to be able to identify them one from the other. Our next DPM, Detector Personality Module, is for an FID, Flame Ionization Detector. That coax right there is a direct feed off of your FID down in the oven. It will interpret that signal and then send it on to let us know exactly what's going on. Our solenoids in the back, those little guys back there firing the valves down in the oven. And in our sample system, there's some more of them there over there. That is the electronics compartment. If you want to know what that's about, I jumpered that out because there's this pressure switch located. And in the event that you get low valve gas pressure for stroking your valves and stuff like that, it will trip that pressure switch and then throw your GC into fault. So we just get rid of that guy.